Listeners be advised. The Holiloquy podcast discuss matters related to the human experience and many that are sexual in nature. Due to this, some conversations may surround triggering topics such as sexual violence, self-harm, abuse, and much more. Please be advised, a list of crisis and psychological resources will be available in the show notes of this episode. With that said, let's get started with the show. Ladies and gentlemen, may I have your attention please as we go through the following safety instructions. In the event that there is a loss of cabin pressure, oxygen mask will drop from the overhead. Place the mask over your nose and mouth breathe normally as oxygen is flowing even if the mask is not be sure to adjust your own mask. Hello, 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 everyone. Welcome to the Holy Loki Podcast, where we step out and speak on sexuality. This is your favorite host, Ferdinand T. Scott, also known as Slater Jackson. And for you freaky motherfuckers out there, Sebastian Adams. On today's episode, we are getting into my bag, y'all. And I'm not talking about the whole bag. I'm talking about the thing that made me a doctor. I'm talking about rape culture. Yes. And joining me for this conversation is Michelle Shakina. How are you doing today? I'm doing wonderful. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Of course. So if you all did not hear her last episode, I need you to stop what you're doing. Okay, you can finish this episode. Like, come on, you're (laughs) already here. But after that, go back and listen to that episode. Understand her story, know her story, and appreciate her story and learn and improve your own story. So definitely go back and listen to that. Um, But for today, we will be talking about rape culture, but before we get into that conversation, Michelle, do you mind introducing yourself to the audience once more for those who are new to the podcast? And on top of that, uh, let them know about your website. So, how, okay. you know, all the great things about you. Thank you. Of course I will. Um, well, I was a stay-at-home mom for many years, married for almost, well, over 20 years with two kids that needed a lot of attention because they had some issues. So I was that stay-at-home mom that did the PTA president thing, that did the room parent. I was active in the community. I did all of that. Um, I, it looked like a fairy tale life. And at some point that ended and um, my ex-husband who had a secret life brought me into a world of, I call it the Alice in Wonderland world that was filled with sex and drugs and alcohol and secrets and deviance and all of that. So I'll stop there maybe, or do you want me to keep going? Oh, the website. Oh, the website is from the floor to the door.com. It is my story of going from the floor to the door. Um, I'm in the process of writing actually two books. The first one is that title. And um, that it means a lot to me because I literally was on the floor and went to the door and escaped and and ran out. Mm-hmm. And um, so that's the website. On the website is you can contact me if you need anything, any sort of help, any references of how to get help. If you need a listening ear, if you need coaching, any of that. Um, I can Mm -hmm. certainly help you. I also have a blog on there that I write pieces from my book, things coming from my heart. Um, Hopefully it'll open your eyes a little bit on something that you might be questioning or don't even realize. And um, some other things on there. That's my website from the floor to the door.com. That's what that. Excellent. Well, thank you so much. So you all, it will be in the show notes for anybody who uh, would like to connect with her. Again, listen to that uh, last episode as well. And then after you listen to both of her episodes, you can listen to everybody else's, okay? Just, you know. (laughs) But uh, let's get into this conversation related to rape culture. The first topic of today is about consent. And consent is important. And I like to tell people... um, One, yes, it needs to be an enthusiastic yes, but yes means yes, no means no, and maybe just does not exist, okay? So um, that's usually how I introduce those conversations about consent. But Michelle, how important 
is consent to you? Extremely important. Consent is everything. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, if, if you don't give consent, if you don't have consent, you stop. That's all. Consent is a big stop sign. Agree. And I, th- I don't like the, that we're in a culture um, here in the U.S. or actually you might as well say globally. Uh, in a lot of societies, you see that consent is like the last thing that anybody really acknowledges. It's all about the brutality. It's all about the forcing mm-hmm. other people, the coerce- coercion and persuasion of other people and making them do things that makes them uncomfortable and don't make them feel whole. Uh, I for me, I strive to incorporate consent in everything that I do. I know some of that is because of past traumas, but also do that so that other people don't have to experience the same things that I've experienced or that I've gone through. And also for them to feel heard in a situation because once you start being consent for it, once you start allowing people to um, say their piece, uh, provide their perspective on things and give the inf- information that you need, it gives you an opportunity to make a decision as well. Yeah. It, and when you mm-hmm. reciprocate that and you provide that information to them, they can they can make a better decision about how they choose to move forward, how they mm-hmm. want to interact with you. Like consent gives you... Uh, opportunity to really communicate your needs, your wants, your desires, your passions, the things that will make you happy, uh, the things that you want for yourself as it uh, relates to a relationship or just in work itself. Uh, like it's, it's very important. It's such a, a small thing, but it has such a major impact. Mm-hmm. Very true. Very, very true. And uh, I know one of the things that we uh, talked about within Mm -hmm. the uh, intake meeting um, Mm -hmm. was that sexual violence happens within, you know, relationships, as Mm -hmm. well as it's something that is very prevalent in uh, queer spaces, especially in the gay community, like gay men's relationships. Mm -hmm. So um, what is your um, sentiment uh, on those issues of, of sexual violence within relationships? Well, that's exactly what I experienced with sexual violence. I experienced Mm. it in the bedroom with just the two of us. And I experienced it with him trafficking me. So with the sexual violence in the bedroom, it was a matter of strangulation to the point where I'd be passed out and I'd come back and he'd still be having sex with me. Mm -hmm. Um, He'd be behind me and doing that or, um, or on top of me, you know, face to face or, putting a belt around my neck, you know, from behind me and thinking that he was doing something that was really cool and sexy and kinky, but yet it's not something that I agreed to. Mm. It wasn't like, oh, I want to do this. You know, it was like, okay, you know, choking thing. Great. That's sexy to some people. It is, it can be, but you don't make your partner pass out. And if you do, you don't keep having sex with them. That's sexual violence. That is considered rape. Um, Mm -hmm. I was told by trauma specialist that if it is unwilling, then that is rape. So non-consensual is rape, unwilling is rape. Even if it's something that's way out of the ordinary, you have to say, is this okay? Is this okay? Mm -hmm. Is this hurting you? Are you okay with this? And yes is the only answer you get. Are you short? Yes. Okay. When Mm -hmm. you're doing, when when you're in the throes of it maybe, and you're doing something, are you okay? Is this okay still? Yes. And if, I mean, come on, we know grunts, groans, acts of pain, you know, sounds of pain, you stop, you mm. just stop. You don't keep going. You don't push forward. You don't push in more. That's not going to help unless that person tells you that they want it, but try and think of it. If they tell you that they want it, are they doing it for you? Or are they doing it for them? Mm. Are they doing it to please you? Or are they doing it for them? They're usually doing it to please you if it's hurting them to that extent, unless that's something that you know of that they're into because you learned it outside of the bedroom. But if at that moment they decide to do that, they're just trying to please you. Mm. So any conversations outside of the bedroom in that realm can be used inside. But if all of a sudden their behavior changes in the bedroom, they're trying to impress you. They're trying to please you. um, Those sorts of things. Um, As far as like the gay community, it's really sad because the community and of which I have many close to me involved or how you 
you say it, but um, including my own child, you know, it's, it's so hard out there, especially now with the laws that are going on. Um, and it's scary. And, you know, you would, you would think and hope that we all say love is love, but yet there's so much domestic violence. And I think that the reason, <laughs> sorry, I think that the reason is because there must be stuff underneath that's going on. Like I know a lot of gay men that are young that, you know, come to me and talk to me as if I'm, you know, their friend or their sister or their mom. And, you know, cause their parents don't accept them. Well, if you don't work on that kind of stuff, it's going to come out and it usually comes out in the form of domestic violence or sexual violence, mm. you know, and, and for my situation, you know, it's assumed based on behavior and things that he said that my ex-husband is bisexual, but will not come out at all. A lot of people around him know it. They can see it. Um, his behavior exerts this, but he will not come out and say it. And because of that, he put me in situations that he might have wanted to be in himself. And that means with multiple men that I did not give consent to be with or in you know, a back room with the door locked, which I did not give consent to, or um, you know, crawling on the floor to go down on somebody that he knows, which I really did not want to do or give consent to, which he later on said that he regrets having me do. Um, but I mean, like he used to say to me, I'd love to see you crawl on the floor of, you know, one of those movie theaters and give a blowjob to everybody. And I'm the mother of his child. I'm, I was his wife. I was loyal. Nobody came near me. I made his breakfast, his lunch, his dinners. He had notes in them. Something was really off. Because mm -hmm. that's something that I don't know what you're watching to think of that and make and think that you can bring that into re realistic terms, but something's definitely wrong there. Um, you know, uh, having me call him by other people's names, other men's names, um, some that he had had me do things with, or people that he really liked for whatever reason, and would record me. Um, he'd grab his phone and either make a video of me on top of him, or he would put the audio and it was always something like that. Mm -hmm. You know, pictures and pictures and videos, you have to really be careful. You know, my thing is now like, bring it out. I did anything I could because he was not nice to me until we were having sex because he had to get me there. But there were certain ways that he did get me there that weren't nice. It was through drugs. It was through alcohol. Um, it was through coercion and lots of grooming. I mean, basically from the minute I met him, it was lots mm. of grooming and it escalated very, very slowly until the end. In the end, it just went like he just took it and went up that escalator as fast as he possibly could. But it was very slowly for a lot of years. And at first he was doing things secretly on his own without me. And, you know, we have since seen websites that he's looked at or places he's been, um, having to Google home or massage parlors that he used to go to. He finally told me things like that. Um, and then when I had told him, you know, after my traumatic event, losing somebody that I wanted to live my life to its fullest, he, it, I feel like it validated him in mm -hmm. everything. It justified everything that he was already doing um, to the point where he's like, awesome. Like now I could really roll with this. And I really did not know what I was saying and who I was saying it to. Mm -hmm. I had no idea. To me, it just meant like, really, let's enjoy every moment, whether it be at home or out or, you know, let's, let's go watch the sunset or the sunrise, you know, instead of sleeping all day or whatever it was, because you like to sleep. The Holiloquy podcast focuses on the variability of sexual expression. When it comes to sexual expression, we often depend on pornography to illustrate how one must perform sexually. For those who have not learned this by now, the stuff you see in porn is not real. Pornography provides a singular perspective of sexual expression that is not often the reality we see during our own sexual encounters. 
The Holiloquy podcast is a conversation that takes you outside of the compressed box of what many know about sex. Some of the topics we discuss includes kinks, condom usage, status disclosure, and past sexual experiences. The Holiloquy podcast steps out on sexual norms and recognizes that the norm is not the only normal. Subscribe today and join the conversation. man like really let's enjoy every moment whether it be at home or out or you know let's let's go watch the sunset or the sunrise you know instead of sleeping all day or whatever it was because you like to sleep it, it was more of that it wasn't it wasn't like take all of my childhood wounds and tell everybody and you know have me take off my clothes or, or give me something and a drink where I would see myself change within an hour, I was, or less, I was a totally different person. Um, I look at pictures now of myself back then, and I don't even recognize her. And I say her because I have disassociated myself with that person. Mm. Yeah. So, um, so there's that. And that is something, it's another word is disassociation. Um, I should say it slower, probably <laughs> disassociation. <laughs> it's, you know, one time I was on a table and placed on there. Well, I was sitting because we were at you know, someone's house, we were having fun. And I thought, all right, this will be safe because there was another female there. And then she left. And then I was there with my ex-husband and two other guys. And I thought these guys were like my brothers, they were cool. But my ex controlled the situation with the drugs and the drinking. And he would pour them or they would pour them and he would go around each person's face and, you know, sniff and do this and do that. And then it was like, oh, here, do it off of her. And then I was placed on a table. And before I knew it, I was getting orally raped and generally raped in the sense that they were allowed to do whatever they wanted except penetration, um, in a sense. And he, he kept it. I mean, he kept the I kept trying to sit up and I'd be pushed down saying like, no, you want it. No, you love this. No, you want this. And before I knew it, I was, I was so incoherent and, and inebriated that I didn't, I couldn't even control my own body um, in the sense that I couldn't sit up. And at some point, and I talked to my therapist about this, who actually had to convince me that it was, this was domestic violence. That's how we justify actions because we're so brainwashed and gaslit. Mm. Um, you know, she, she had told me that, and I, you know, to, to say this, it's pretty heavy, but you know, I said, if that were the case and I didn't want it, why would, why would it feel good? Why would I have an orgasm if I didn't want it? Because even though in your head, it's not consensual, your body doesn't always know that. Mm. And there are nerve sensations and there are nerve endings. And it's just like, if someone puts food in your, in your throat, you're going to swallow it. It's almost like you can't stop it. Have you ever stopped going to the bathroom when you're urinating? It's not easy, right? It's the same. Listen, it's the same genitalia. It's the same function. So she told me that even sometimes when children are, are, you know, being touched inappropriately, what have you, their bodies, you know, um, react to it. And there's a lot of shame there. Mm -hmm. So even, you know, as adults, it's true. But what happens is, at least for me, is the, the disassociation. So in order to, so there's, there's a few things here. So disassociation can happen when you're drinking and when you're dreaming. Um, people do it when they, when they hurt themselves, self-harm. So I remember that a lot of times I was put in these situations and my mind would go elsewhere or it would just get numb. Kind of like if you ever look, I don't know if they still have them, but if you look at a, a picture that's like a 3D picture and you have to kind of relax your eyes and your brain so you could see it separate, um, it's almost like that's what you do in order to go somewhere else. But at some point, your brain and your body have to come back together. Mm -hmm. And a lot of times that can take years because you can walk around this world and function and you could still be disassociated with your body and your brain. And that's why people do yoga or meditation. Um, you know, I had a self-harming phase out of nowhere and I didn't understand it because I'm a healthcare worker. 
and I'm a mother and I'm, I'm the one who helps everybody. But at some point, you know, it actually happened by accident first. Um, and I burned myself by accident, you know, ladies, for those of you that are curling your hair and you somehow the curling iron always ends up in the air and you go to catch it, which you should not do. <laughs> and it, I burn right now. Right? Don't ask. So, but then, right, right, exactly. But what happened, or a flat iron, and what happened was whatever was going on in my head at that moment, I forgot about it. And that's why, you know, kids or whatever, people do drugs is to forget about it at that moment. Mm. That's why some people eat too much or, or, you know, overeat some of us or, you know, we watch TV all the time and we're, you know, we're, bin, you know, we're binge, binge watching whatever for days because we don't want to face reality or sometimes it's the flip side. You need a break from reality. So sometimes the pain is too much where, right, you do that or it's a way to bring your body and your mind back because it shocks the nervous system, just like drugs do, just like rape does. So um, there's that. So that's something to really be mindful of and aware of if you've gone through trauma. Are my brain and my, are my brain and my body aligned together? Do they feel connected? And a lot of times it's not. You know, it's it's just not. They're yeah. like if you find yourself zoning out a lot, there's a reason for that. And there's ways to do it where you come back together in a healthy way. Mm-hmm. Hurting yourself, hurting yourself is obviously not a good one. Drinking too much is not a good one. And I, I'm glad that you mentioned those because like most definitely in like the atmosphere that we live in, the society that we live in, and the messages that's pushed, the narratives that are pushed, um, we are given so many vices, we're given so many false coping mechanisms yeah. and uh, escapism is uh, extremely pushed mm-hmm. on everybody's we have yeah. to escape our problems rather than deal with our problems it's because that's yes. easier yes. and drugs is just one of those things to help us escape from it to help us Absolutely. not deal with it alcohol weed marijuana yeah, I was all of that. Say. yeah, yeah. like cocaine all the drugs yeah. Mm -hmm. everything sex even um Mm -hmm. as a way for us to remove ourselves from the things that we're dealing with rather than facing those things we'll Mm ratify those little nuggets of pleasure uh in order to keep us going uh, just yet another day Mm -hmm. rather than accepting that okay this is the thing that happened Uh, this is a thing that's hurting me in this moment this is something that uh is going on be it financially or any type of trauma or whatever the Mm -hmm. case is we'll rather not acknowledge those things because it's easier to sweep it up up under the rug it's easier life seems easier to not address it but at the end of the day we have to come to a point to recognize that it's still under the rug it's still right there it has not been swept outside it has not been taken care of and until we do take care of it when we do indulge in those uh, escapist things, when we do indulge in those um, vices, it's a little bit different then. Now I'm getting high without the drama. I'm getting high right. without the, the trauma. I'm getting, right. um, I'm drinking, uh, I was about to say drinking marijuana. I'm drinking <laughs> uh, alcohol without right. the, the trauma. I'm just enjoying life in a way that I'm choosing to enjoy it without mm-hmm. anything negative that's impacting it because I've dealt with that. I've dealt with the filth that was behind. Well, I, I don't want to call it filth because that kind of leads into right. the ideal of shaming, but, but yeah. I've dealt with the hurt and pain that I was trying to avoid. Mm-hmm. So now I can continue to move forward. Correct. Um, and a- another thing I wanted to um, go back to uh, is within like just how like having those conversations and understanding um, what your sexual partners want and their desires are. And I know like, well, it's definitely young people and I've, you know, definitely was young myself, still young. Um, mm-hmm. But yes, like, you <laughs> when I uh, was much younger than I am, uh, I remember when I was engaging in sex with some, with some people and I will see something in a porn and I would think, oh, that will be sexy. And I will give that a try without having mm-hmm. that conversation. And then I recognize over time, also in 
in um, diving deeper into learning more about consent and these important conversations, I realized, oh, wait, what if that person was not comfortable with that? Right. <laughs> what right. if that person um, did not feel as though that they can mention how they were uncomfortable in mm-hmm. that moment? And mm-hmm. then that made me shift the way that I engage with people to make mm-hmm. sure that I know, because I don't want, uh, I did not want and still don't want for me to cause any kind of mental or physical harm to somebody just for a hookup or just for, um, you know, engaging with me in the way I want to be engaged in or just for my pleasure. I don't want them to leave that experience thinking that of me in a negative light uh, because I did not have these conversations with them before because I did not make sure that they were fully comfortable. Uh, and one of the things that I've learned, what well, heard from a lot of people, uh, well, a lot of men from my sexual past, mm-hmm. they will tell me that, yeah, having sex with you was a lot different than what I've uh, experienced with other people because I felt comfortable, because um, I, um, you know, had, you know, they had the opportunity to voice or even just have a conversation after sex, uh, because I'm big on aftercare and all of that. Mm -hmm. But oh wow. They could they can have these conversations with me and it's not about I just invited them over just for a fuck and now you have to go. Um they appreciated that I approach sex a lot Mm -hmm. differently than other people. And I was like, Mm -hmm. I should not be like an outcast in that I should not be like the exception for many of the sexual partners that I've had um why is it that I'm not the norm why is it that they don't find this a lot more often but then again when I think about my sexual experiences Mm -hmm. with people I also recognize like oh Mm -hmm. a lot of you are traumatized a lot of you or are um feeding it into the toxic parts of our culture rather Mm -hmm. than accepting yourself rather than wanting to uh, understand that you're not all about sex like you're more than just your um, sexuality you're more than these things like you Mm -hmm. are a whole human being that's yes deserving of actual love and care during your sexual experience you're not just a tool so like um that's one of the things that I battle on a regular basis be it with the um you know, like developing a relationship with somebody, be it romantic or just sexual, or if it's just like, hey, you're horny, I'm horny. Can we just hook up and mm-hmm. just let it do what it do? Yeah. And we don't, we just define whatever happens afterwards. We don't need to define it today. We're just here for the sex. But mm-hmm. even with that, it's an issue because it's hard to even to communicate that with some people because one, they're their level communication is not Mm -hmm. up to par because we're not taught to communicate with others to just being consent forward is scary to other people because it's like why are you at this way and I'm like because I want to make sure I'm safe and you're safe what's up so it's it's just so much to it It, there really is and yeah you shouldn't you shouldn't be the norm I mean Mm -hmm. you should be the norm I should say it shouldn't Mm -hmm. be like you know, you're the unicorn. I mean, I'm the same way with you. Like aftercare is huge for me. Um, you know, we talked about this before. I, I'm all into the snacks with sex, you know, and hydrating <laughs> because it is like exercise and mm-hmm. it could be fun. And then you also, you know, it's feeding is a way of showing love for most people. Um, and I think that's really great. And aftercare is huge. But like I said, the conversation before outside of the bedroom is so important. And then the conversation in the bedroom also. And then afterwards, like a recap. It's like when you have a meeting, you know, and um, or a project you did together and you want to recap it, what worked and what didn't work. But um, it, it is really, it's kind of scary nowadays because you, mm-hmm. you just don't know. And, you know, I was, I was married until five years ago. And I, so that's my, you know, I'm middle age. That's my entire whole life. So wow. I come out and I'm like, what is going on here now? And I'm pretty old fashioned, you know, and especially now after what I've been through, I'm really protective of my body. Like mm. if you have to earn the right to come here. And exactly. Yes. And it, that should be anybody. That shouldn't be just because I have been, you know, raped multiple times. Um, it should be anybody feels that way. Like this is my body. I didn't create it, but I'm certainly going to protect it. 
in the sense mm. that, you know, I eat well also, I don't exercise as much as I should or whatever, but you know, it's, it's just, nobody can touch me unless I say it. I have a shirt that I wear because I decide. Um, and that's just, you know, a thing. And we talked about this before, like if somebody cheats and doesn't and sleeps with somebody else and they come to you, especially like when the next day and they don't tell you, I feel like that's non-consensual sex because mm -hmm. you don't know that they couldn't have caught something and came to you with it. Mm -hmm. My biggest thing is during COVID when that happened, people were cheating. Now you got a whole different thing to worry about in addition to STDs. Yeah, exactly. Child, yes. yes. Oh my God. So that's a whole, that was like a whole thing. And everybody was sleeping with everybody back then that I know of. But, you know, because everybody was just scared and clueless. But, mm -hmm. you know, the thing about it is it's these, these are, these conversations are so important because, well, obviously, legally, they're important, but your experience will be so much better once you have it. Mm -hmm. Because a lot of people also walk around and they either pretend that they don't know what they want because they don't want to tell you they're afraid to tell you um so i think if at this point if you're like me i'm the type of person where i don't really care what you think in regards to this is who i am um there's one this is what this is this is what i want this is what i like this is what i'm willing to give to you this is what i'd like from you in return um kind of like a job. You know, I always say relationships are like a job and a relationship could be a one night stand. Relationship could be, you know, a week, a weekend together, or you met somebody at, you know, a party or a pride parade and you want to go home. you got to have the conversation. And, and cause it can, it can go from, from really great and amazing to horrible in two seconds mm -hmm. and the reverse. It can go from really bad to like, Oh, I didn't know you liked that. You know, and um, and that's that's really a big deal. And then you get consent. Consent just comes with that. Yes. Because, and 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 it just it's a natural flow. And there are ways to do it where it's done naturally. Right. You know. Now I think about the scene I wrote in in my book about mm -hmm. uh, it was related to consent, and it, I just remember sitting and just thinking about, oh, what do I want? What feels comfortable for me? Mm -hmm. And I drafted that, and I just wrote yeah. the scene and building that, and mm -hmm. I even mentioned in there that the atmosphere just felt so right, yeah. and then, you know, the persons in that scenario, they start to engage mm -hmm. in sex and all this other stuff, and then mm -hmm. I make a point in, to mention but what was missing here and that right. is the conversation about sex because uh because just because a situation feels right for you doesn't always mean that it's right for another person and that's the thing right. I really hate with a lot of the media that we indulge in like yeah I get it in terms of like cinematic reasons mm -hmm. we just have to make it seem so very magical right. but most people don't have that knowledge of knowing that the the atmosphere is not really there. Like <laughs> the, the chemistry may not really be there. Most definitely since these people are just meeting each other right. and you have this person just go off and kiss this other person. Like yeah. what's right yeah. for you is not right for me. Right because for me. look, You don't yeah. have the right scent to get me in the mood. You don't yeah. have the right yeah. vibes. The music ain't playing. Like what, what yeah. did you think this was? Like yeah. <laughs> right. Exactly. Yep. I agree with that. That's very, very true. And that kind of goes along with everything too. It's all about atmosphere, conversation, mm -hmm. all of that. And you really need to have that in order for it to be a really good experience. Mm -hmm. and I mean who knows a one night stand can turn into something that's a great relationship exactly or vice versa to be honest so it can uh, go from go from something where you think it's great but if if you don't vibe in the bedroom it, it, there's no going you can't fake that mm -mm. yeah you can't fake that like, um, mm -hmm. but to shift the conversation a little bit still within rape culture, we mm -hmm. need to go ahead and tackle it because let's go off on it because I know you got your uh, feelings about it and I know I got my own because it impacts my dating experience every mm -hmm. fucking day. And that's toxic masculinity. <laughs> uh, yeah. Oh, 
how do you feel about that? It's there. It's exhausting. It's exhausting. It's exhausting. <laughs> and it's funny because my gay, my gay daughter is like, she's so, she's like, I hate men. I hate cis <laughs> men and I hate, and it's just, it's terrible. It really is. It's, it's so, I mean, I lived with that and I was surrounded by it with the guys that, you know, were around me for so long. Um, it's just, it's a horrible thing and I don't understand it. I really, I really don't understand it. I mean, in today's day and age, but then you've got politicians that are doing it. So, mm. I mean, there are great role models for the opposite. Um, but it, I don't, I don't even know. I don't even know how to stop that part of it. It's um, so, it's tough. Um, it is, it, it is tough. But the challenge is that, well, see, I, I see that there's, there's definitely a shift happening. Mm-hmm. Um, because, you know, it's kind of like, you know, when something bad happens, you look for the heroes. If you look for the tragedy, you're going to find it. If you look for the heroes, you'll find those too. Um, I, I've been, you know, I follow on social media a lot, of, a lot of men, a lot of couples that are the opposite of toxic masculinity. Um, I have a good circle of men now that are my, they're my sheepdogs. They look out for me. And they are these strong dominant, beautiful, kind, loving men that if something happened to you, they would, they would help you. And it's the, it's the clear opposite. Um, you know, it's, it's my buddy and he's like the head of them. And so he told me there's three types of people. There's, there's the sheep dog, the wolf and the sheep. And the sheep are those that follow everybody else. They have mm-hmm. really no opinion on anything, whatever it is. They just do whatever. Then you've got the wolf. And that was my ex-husband. He wants to hurt everybody. They want to hurt anything around them. They eat anything. They'll just do anything they want. And then the sheepdogs are the ones that are protective. And, you know, I think that if you know those three, and it could be women too, Mm -hmm. um, but I think that if you know those three different characteristics, then you can, and you can identify them and you know, this person's a wolf, then run, you know, Mm -hmm. run and hide, run, hide, walk, done. If it's a sheep, you have to decide, is it someone that, you know, I want to be around because you've got toxic, toxic masculinity, then you have beautiful masculinity and then you got nothing like right in the middle, you know, mm. and then they're just kind of existing. They are, they're kind of existing. And, and I don't know, those guys, I think will sway either way. Sometimes they'll be, cause they don't know who they are. Yes. It's usually the issue. And, and it could be from trauma and tragedy when they were children losing a parent when they were young. It could be any of that, not having good role models. And I think that those are the kinds of people that sometimes will lean more towards a wolf if they're not careful, Um, but they could have potential to be a sheepdog if they have the right training. And like, luckily some of these guys that I know of, um, they they do men's leadership retreats and they turn some of these toxic masculine guys into sheepdogs. And it's, it's unbelievable to watch. It's beautiful to watch. Mm, and that. yeah, it is. It's beautiful. And they, you know, they, they strip them down to the bare bones of who they are as a human being. And they put them through physical, you know, physical uh, exhaustion. And what happens is their pain comes through. And once that pain comes through, the toxicity is gone. It's like poison in their body. Mm. And, you know, I stay away from those guys because I can see them a mile away now, for sure. I could see them a mile away. And even if I have a hint, I walk away. It's not worth it. It really isn't. But a lot of them are actually sheep and they don't know what to do. So they become toxic. Mm-hmm. But my thing is like, if, if you don't, you know, I, I tried to save everyone for a long time. Like I'd be going to these parties where people are half naked and they're drinking or whatever. And they want me to put on a show and I'm like helping them win their lives, you know, or we'd end up at a strip joint because that's where my ex-husband wanted to go. And I'd be talking to the girls about their lives. And he's like, stop making friends with the strippers. Like I was trying to help them, you know, <laughs> and, and cause everyone's got a story and everyone's mm-hmm. got pain. And the challenge with the men is that they think dominating somebody else is going to make them feel better. Mm. And in fact, it might, but then they have to put their heads down on the pillow when they go to sleep. And then there's that little second and moment of 
consciousness that they realize that they aren't who they say they are. They're not who they project themselves. Mm. They might have to have a few drinks to eliminate it. I know quite a few of those guys. They'll drink themselves to oblivion right before they go to sleep and they go to sleep. It's crazy. I've had conversations with them because these were what I thought were friends of mine. Mm-hmm. And they'd be going to bed, we'd be, going, we'd be on the phone, and I could hear the drinking being poured over and over and over and over again. And then it was like, boom, out. Because they didn't want that moment when they put their heads down to be aware of anything. And it's sad. It's really sad. But, it is. And you know, the challenge is that we do have a lot of people in our public view that are like this. Mm-hmm. And it's justified. And rationalized. It's rationalized. It's rationalized. And normalized. (laughs) And normalized. (laughs) And it's and it's scary. And it's scary. And Mm -hmm. you know, it just it's tough. And anyone that's put into position of power, and even if it's someone who thinks that they have power and they're CEO Mm -hmm. of their own company and you know, they're they're a company of two people. If they think they're a CEO, then they walk around out in the neighborhood. Or they go to a bar and they walk around and they think that they're all this. And, you know, that's the narcissism that comes out. Mm. And then they're just rude to everyone, especially the waitresses or the servers or whatever it is. Usually the female. If you're talking about male, female and heterosexual, then that's the case. Mm. You know, I haven't had any of that in the gay community. I haven't experienced it. Um, Whether it be male or female, I haven't experienced that. Because whether somebody is anatomically this, or they identify as this, there's a masculine and a feminine in all of us. Mm-hmm. And, you know, we might veer w- towards one versus the other a little stronger, but we all have that. Um, exactly. And and so I haven't, I haven't experienced that, that I can remember at the moment. I just, in the forefront of my head, I've experienced it with men mm-hmm. um, that I know personally that I was married to. Um, that I might be dating, I might experience it. But um, as as a survivor, I I go toe to toe with that those people, absolutely. You know, but I was also raised by a very strict parent. But actually, both of them were very strict, and so I can see it from a mile away. Yeah. So. And it's it's important to recognize it because it's a lot of mental trauma that is attached with it and is a mm-hmm. lot of insecurity that's attached to it as well oh, from that's, the person yeah. who holds the toxic mm-hmm. masculinity or the person that they projected it onto yep. and All it makes it. like it, there's this need for acceptance yep. uh and validation in who this person has happens to be as a, a man most definitely uh, mm-hmm. for the masculine presenting people like they mm-hmm. need the validation and Mm -hmm. i i know for myself i refuse to allow any other person to identify me for whatever reason that they feel the need to do so or Mm -hmm. feel as though that they have the right to take my man card or my like i don't care like if you feel as though i'm less of a a man because of whatever i do then i don't have to Mm -hmm. associate myself with you because Mm -hmm. who are you um (laughs) i'm not on this earth to follow whatever you think uh, right. I'm here to love myself and experience my life and Absolutely. enjoy my life how it goes. And I think um, it is it's needed to have those conversations, most definitely with a lot of young men, because they do fall in that trap. Because like you mentioned, being sheep, um, you said that like you said they have the ability of being molded into a sheepdog they Mm -hmm. have the um capabilities of being uh molded into a wolf Mm -hmm. they're at this point where you're Mm -hmm. following um uh, to me i think uh when you said that there's just nothing there i just Mm -hmm. thought of a non-playable character so an npc so it's like Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. this is somebody who's waiting for their narrative to be made for them and when you are able to detract that and bring them to something that's a lot more fulfilling for them where they don't need the outside um motivations or uh outside voices to facilitate who they identify as Mm -hmm. the stronger that they become and i think one of the things that really would tear down the walls of toxic masculinity is if uh, a lot more 
people who hold that, uh, most definitely men who hold that, are able to get into therapy, are able to yep. get into um, accepting help from other people, accepting help Absolutely. for themselves, and just acknowledging that, you know what, it is okay for me to cry. It is okay for me to feel right. the things that I'm feeling. It right. is okay for me to have a moment to understand what is going on in my life in this moment. Absolutely. Absolutely. And you don't need to just like man up and move on exactly. and, you know, or what have you. And, you know, I've had to really deal with that with, with my son because, mm. you know, he's had his father who did all these things, you know, be his role model, so to speak. Um, especially the last few years, because when we separated, um, my son chose to be with his father so that he could be the parent and take care of him because there were a lot of times we'd have to go pick him up from wherever he was drinking and what have you. And, you know, my, so my, my ex was habitually hiring people for himself um, for whatever reasons. There are a few reasons why somebody would do that. Well, he decided to do so for my son's 18th birthday. That was his birthday present hmm. um, was to break his virginity with somebody who my son did not know or meet um, until that moment. And that that's how he would, that would be his first sexual encounter. Wow. And I know, and my kid is really sweet. He's got so much empathy. He, I mean, he's the kind that, um, again, he had his issues growing up and bullying. So he has a lot of empathy and his empathy shows up with trying to help women, girls, like his friends that have really toxic boyfriends. And he's just very kind. And, you know, he's a cool guy and he's all, he's all masculine and boy and he's, you know, so tough, but, but um, in a good way, cause he, he's not as tough as he wants to portray himself, but <laughs> um, you know, he'll, he'll drive, you know, way out of his way to, to get a girl if she needs a ride home from her boyfriend's house. Cause you know, so he's a bit of a people pleaser, let's be honest, but that was his first encounter. And apparently when he turned 21 during COVID, it was supposed to happen again. And, you know, I said, what do you, no, I mean, it's COVID. Like it's bad enough that you're doing that, but you're, you got, no. And I didn't know about what happened. Um, I wasn't told until like an hour before on my kid's 18th birthday, that was going on. I was left in the dark. It was planned with his buddy, um, my, my ex-husband's friend, um, the two of them worked it out. And I wasn't told until an hour before it happened. When I was told I was livid, as you can imagine any mother would be. And then I started, and then he, I started finding that he was emailing, my ex-husband was emailing with the girl. Um, and which another friend of mine realized that that's when my marriage started going downhill. Um, put those, put those two together. Um, so, so there's an opportunity there for my kid to become really toxic, right? because that's who he's been raised by as far as his male role model. Well, I refuse to let that happen because as a woman raising a son, I feel like I have a really big responsibility because I don't want him to be, or I should say I want him to be somebody who is kind and loving and is not afraid of his own emotions and expresses them and talks to women and and definitely consent. And he's all about consent because he tells me everything, whether I want to hear it or not, <laughs> about his encounters now. And he's not me as sexy as to tell me. And he tells me every detail. I'm like, you don't need to tell me every single detail. <laughs> but it's very <laughs> funny, right? And I mean, this is how we roll, so it's fine. Um, but you know, we talk about all this stuff, and I really feel like it's my responsibility because he's still impressionable, you mm -hmm. know. And um, to teach him about, well, what he, I mean, he already knows what to toxic masculinity is and what is the opposite thereof. And how being the opposite, it doesn't mean that you're a mama's boy, you know, it just means that you're a good guy. And right. well, what if good guys, you know, good guys end up last. I'm like, that's not really true. Mm -mm. Good guys end up with good women or good men, whoever they want, you know, I'm talking about his situation. So, and there's really a fear there and, and because apparently the women are toxic. And again, we're talking about the heterosexual couple just because that's my son. Um, with my daughter, it's totally different. Um, you know, the women are toxic, he said. 
He said, they want a guy who's an asshole. They don't want somebody who's nice to them. And he says, they're horrible too. And I said, you know what? The one time that you're going to be nice to someone, I bet she'll have a friend that's nice or you'll meet that person that fit, that suits you. He said, so you don't change your character based on who you're with. Change who you're with, <laughs> not your character. Exactly. You know? And, um, and for, my, for my daughter who's gay, she just, she's had good experiences from what I know of. Um, she hasn't quite dated anybody yet. She's 18. And it's funny. They, um, my son and his best girlfriend, who's also gay, took her to a club the other night where they allow 18 and over. And apparently she had a really great time and everybody was so nice to her, um, I was told. And it was really great that that was her first experience with other women in that scene because um, I was really nervous about that because that really, mm -hmm. that first impression makes like, is this, is this going to work out for me in my life? Mm. Or, you know, is this going to be like going to high school and the girls are going to mean to me? Well, no, it's not because it's a different kind of relationship. It's a different kind of meeting. You're meeting in different ways and different terms. Um, your values are more aligned. So those are my thoughts on toxic masculinity. <laughs> Oh no, it's beautiful thoughts as well. Exactly. Like um, you uh, triggered a memory uh, huh? when you were talking about how you wanted uh, her to have just like you were happy about her uh, first experience being mm -hmm. such, such a positive one because yeah. it really does set a tone it for a, a lot of people. And I thought about just even my first sexual experience and mm -hmm. how I well willingly uh I, mm -hmm. my first willing uh sexual experience i mm -hmm. wanted that to be something where i felt safe and i wanted it to be something that i was more comfortable with and just from my experience with that first person um I did not accept anything less than that um, for any other person I decided to engage with mm -hmm. and because I had just that as the peak uh, mm -hmm. at the time I was like if if you're not providing this energy I just don't want it yep. I just don't want it and I think exactly that's the importance of having the patience and having the comfort and knowing yourself before going into certain situations that mm -hmm. may may um go either way positive or negative mm -hmm. uh, and if you surround yourself with people most definitely if it's engaging in a, a community that you're a part of but mm -hmm. you're still you know baby gay but right like... exactly she's totally baby that's so cute I love like... that I forgot about that term <laughs> right? and just knowing that oh this can be amazing because I've experienced many toxic gay uh mm -hmm. areas yeah like, hey, i'm sure clubs and everything like that yeah. you just like i'm extremely uncomfortable in here um but i've also experienced those that were just loving and just very it just brings life into you and those things mm -hmm. last so long but um to close out well we're still going to mm -hmm. do a would you rather uh, okay. i got a good one for you too but let's talk about that proposal culture mm -hmm. um because like many people don't associate proposals and doing proposals and all that with rape culture, but it's very related. Uh, <laughs> so what is your take on proposal culture in general? I think it's horrible what's going on now. Mm -hmm. um, I was proposed to within two months of meeting my ex-husband and he proposed to me in front of a hundred people. And I was stunned and shocked and full of fear we had talked about getting married and that sort of thing, but it was so new. Mm -hmm. And, you know, there's all of our family and all of our friends and somebody leading a service. And all of a sudden the eyes are on me and it happened so quickly before I know he's on his knee. And I was like, what is happening? And I looked over at my parents and I was like, what's going on? And they were all excited. And, you know, I, I read an article today about this. Like, what if that person didn't want to do it? Mm -hmm. And the article certainly was about the fact that the person said yes, and then they went home and then she really, you know, told them the truth about it. But I mean, there was a party plan for us and everything at my house that I had no idea was going on. So I didn't say anything for like a minute, minute and a half. And they're finally like, well, and I said, yeah, yes. 
And he wanted to get married immediately. But within a year and a half, we got married, um, started a business, had a child, bought a house, everything. Um, now I know better. Um, but the whole proposing in front of a group of people, prom proposals, all of that needs to end. It puts way too much pressure on both parties, really. Mm -hmm. um, I think a lot of the times, you know, of course, now social media with whatever they're doing and then parents. And it's really nobody's business but those two people. Mm -hmm. And I think it, we need to get back to sacred ground. I think that too much is out there in the open. Um, there's too much being posted. There's too much, oh my gosh, I don't know what to do about her conversations. Um, I don't know what to tell him. I don't know if I should be with this guy. There's too much of us spreading our thoughts and questioning what we should do and getting help from other people. Yes, some of that is necessary and good, mm -hmm. but it's, and listen, I'm guilty myself. We need to go within and stop reading all the articles or looking at the social media stuff. Mm. I mean, it's so much information. It's amazing that any of us get up, shower and go out of our house. Because I mean, I know from my head, like my brain hurts at the end of the day or even halfway through the day from all the stuff, because I'm also a constant, I like to read and take notes and things like that. So I look for information, um, but just on social media, it's so much, it's mm -hmm. way too much. And, you know, I know now that my last child has graduated high school and going to college, like the whole promposal thing, who started that and why? Right. I mean, honestly, my girlfriend are like, who started, who sent out the first dick pic? And, and what girl said, oh, that's great. You know, where did that start? I mean, right. Like whose brilliant idea was that? And what, what woman was like, or man was like, oh, wow, that's sexy. Give me another one. I don't know. We were just laughing about that the other day, you know, but we're middle-aged. I mean, listen, there are some sexy ones, but we were just, I don't know. It's just something, it's funny after a couple of drinks, you know, you laugh about that kind of yeah. thing. But sure. Like who, who had the nerve to do that? But anyway, so it's the same idea. It's like enough already with the propose, proposing mm -hmm. and, you know, going to a shopping mall and like breaking out into song and then, you know, the guy getting on his knee and or whatever it is, let it be sacred. Mm -hmm. Have a conversation about it because maybe somebody isn't ready. Maybe they want to be with you and they love you, maybe in a few years, but, you know, they'd want to talk to you mm -hmm. and say, I'll wear the ring but I don't want to get married until for a few more years. I don't want to get married till I finish school. I don't want to get married till I, I become a doctor or I don't want to get married until I heal myself or I'm not ready mm. because I'm still traumatized. You know, I'm still traumatized from my marriage. I'm not ready to think about the rest of my life. I'm just trying to get through the day. Like I'm just trying to figure out how to, you know, get through the weekend, whatever it is. And that pressure is just, I mean, it's pressure for both. It really is. I mean, I'm not opposed to asking someone to marry me if, if that were something that I wanted, but usually it's the more masculine or the man, whatever it is in that situation. Um, I would not want to be that person either. Mm -hmm. It's a lot of pressure. And to do that in front of a big group of people and to do that too soon, you know, it, it's, yeah. it shouldn't, it shouldn't be. I mean, it's different with the older generations. Um, they were supposed to get married when they were in their teens or late teens. And, you know, my parents were married for well over 60 years. And that's rare. And it's a beautiful thing. And we talk about it and celebrate it. And we've got a lot of kids. I mean, they were having sex left and right every day. You know, I don't know how. <laughs> but, you know, the oldest takes care of the youngest. So, um, anyway. Exactly. But... You know, um, I don't even know how they proposed or if they eloped, who knows, but um, it's just, it's something that should be sacred. That's my yeah. take on it. <clears throat> I feel like, I feel like conversations need to be sacred. Too many people are talking to their exes about their current relationship. Why? Mm. What is that all about? Exactly. That, that I don't get. If you want to be with them, be with them. If you don't, don't. Exactly. I mean, why mess up? All, it's just it's a horrible situation if you're doing that just stop it's not necessary yeah i agree with you on everything yeah. like with the sorry with the proposals 
there is a lot of pressure that's put on the person. There's even the fear of rejection of uh, the right. proposal that the other right. person has to deal with because that's a possibility. Absolutely. It's just so much anxiety that is within um, public proposals. Right. And I agree. Keep those things private. And just right. if you want everybody to know, just have an engagement party after everybody's right. engaged. Everybody exactly. About it. Look, y'all, right. this is what happened. And now... Right. And, Get to celebrate together it takes right. away that anxiety it, you know that they're proposing because mm-hmm. it's something that they want to do and it's not mm-hmm. because they either love you so much that they w- didn't want to fear they didn't want mm-hmm. to reject you in public yep. and have you feel some type of way about that mm-hmm. or if they just genuinely are not ready <laughs> it's yeah. like it's so much that deals yeah. with it and I even, mean, mm-hmm. yeah. like, even with the uh, thing about um, conversations with X, yeah, or even going to social mm-hmm. media for all your problems. It right. does need to be limited. I get if yeah. you're looking for professional help, then make right. sure that you're in the professional settings for those conversations. Right. Make sure right. that it's a group that is um, that you know that there's at least somebody that's in there that's a coach, therapist, what have you, who right. can look at you specifically and give you a generalized uh, right. answer, as well as give you some uh, uh, opportunity to pay for their service so that mm-hmm. you can get, get everything that you need to help out your relationship. Mm-hmm. Uh, and uh, I, I know like even for myself, I do, you know, chat with my ex every now and mm-hmm. again, but not because of like any kind of relationship problems. The only mm-hmm. time I communicated with my ex about a relationship is when I asked him how I was in our relationship okay. so I that's, can improve that's healthy. for that's a beautiful. better relationship I love that that's, like, that's beautiful really like, that is that's, like, that's that's the kind of conversation that is only for me mm-hmm. to do better going forward uh mm-hmm. and not to continue to look back because mm-hmm. that's not what I want it's not the relationship mm-hmm. that I wanted at the time and it's great and we both have that understanding that we're probably not ever going to get back together and that's yeah. great for the both of us right um so it's like that's the only kind of conversation about relationships that I am comfortable with having with my, with an ex. If he yeah. asked me, oh, what was things like in our relationship so I can improve for, you know, the future of my mm-hmm. next relationship? Of course, I would let you know. This is what I had an issue with. This is what was unhealthy. And this is where I actually loved about you. And mm-hmm. this is what was beneficial towards our relationship together. And that's about mm-hmm. it. That's all the conversation yeah. that we need to have. I love that. <laughs> like, yeah, I love that. I love that. No, that's really great. That's very healthy, actually. Mm-hmm. That's that's a great idea. And then, you know, if you are if, if you're someone talking to your ex and you meet someone, I think the conversation needs to be had. Mm-hmm. Listen, I'm still talking to my ex. You know, maybe we can meet. This is why I'm talking to them. And then you give them the choice. Again, it's consent. You give them the mm-hmm. choice. Do they want to be with you? Um, do they want to meet your ex, whatever? Um, and then you have to have that boundary. Whereas I'm not going to talk about my new relationship with my old relationship. Mm. No, I can't, I'm not going to mix the two because that's just so, not healthy for anybody. It's not like having no. those conversations is very important. Even like right. with the situation I'm in um, with my person, like I even communicate that with people that I hook up with just in case they catch feelings or if they caught feelings, I can have the conversation at that point. Or mm-hmm. if they're, uh, if we're moving towards like a friends with benefit kind of situation, I'll let them know, hey, there's this other person that's here. Uh, we're figuring these things out about what we are going to be. Mm-hmm. And in that process, just let you know, you're not going to be a priority because I'm prioritizing this relationship right. or anything else. Right. But you know, it's all about the communication. If you decide to stay, cool. If things happen and I start to re- reconnect or disconnect with uh, one of the people, we are going to have the conversation mm-hmm. <laughs> because it's right. important. I don't want anybody to be blindsided about, oh my gosh, Vernon doesn't like like me anymore or he doesn't love mm-hmm. me anymore. No, that's we're going to talk about it. <laughs> love that. That's really great. Mm-hmm. It's all about and- these healthy conversations. We need right, that. absolutely no matter what and you know the only the only challenge is that when you've got somebody who's really traumatized Mm. um unable to have the conversation I mean I've been in that boat myself and sometimes it's you're so like I've been so triggered where I can't talk about whatever situation or I need a moment or I need a day or even two days 
And, you know, that person has to, again, decide if this is someone they want to be with or not. <clears throat> and if so, they give them that space. Um, a lot of times when people are traumatized, they really don't want the space. Um, they might say that they do, but they don't want to. Um, so that's, that's a little tricky. And I would say most people that are traumatized who don't talk about their stuff in a healthy way usually want someone to hear them. Mm. And it's somewhat the opposite. They're, they've got such a protective wall. I love myself included. You know, it's so what you can email me. Contact <laughs> me on my website. I'll, I'll talk to you all day long about it. Um, no, seriously, because I, I would understand somebody. Somebody who hasn't had severe, intense trauma won't understand that. They won't see it. And they might take you at face value. But what you're saying is not what you really mean. And that's, that's, and I know, and they'll see it as manipulation where someone who's been through a lot will see it as I'm just protecting myself. So that could be a whole other show for us. Right. Look, I'm always true. open to it. Yeah, <laughs> but it's true. Very true. That's actually reframing some conversations I've recently had okay. um, that I might need to revisit. Okay. Um, <laughs> so, but, Take um, right. Take my notes. Mm -hmm. um, but are you ready for a, a would you rather? Oh gosh, here we go again. Let's see. Yes. I, I think I, I feel like I know your answer to this. Right. Yeah, um, I love it. Let's hear it. You probably so, do. <laughs> would you rather give up kissing for the rest of your life or give up any foreplay? You know, that's wait. Who's wait? It depends on the kissing. It depends on the foreplay. <laughs> <laughs> is it like, is it like, amazing kissing and Ooh. amazing foreplay Ooh, I let's do, go I mean, with that we do love yes. the kissing i don't know i'll have to go with it i can't give up the kissing kissing is foreplay listen my body's gonna react my body's gonna react the same way if it's that good we talked about the splash pad needed <laughs> splash <laughs> no baby put on your goggles michelle, michelle's getting some kissing I feel like for me, it would yeah, it would have to be here. I have to give up the kissing. Like yeah. I okay. I do enjoy like if I really connect with the person and I really right. like them, I want to kiss them. I yeah, enjoy well, the what, moment. Well, that's what I was thinking. Yeah, yeah. That's what I was thinking actually. But like, but, I feel I like for foreplay, all right. If the kissing is like mm -hmm. all versions of kissing, then mm -hmm. I, I cannot do that. I cannot do that because I like to kiss um, down my partner's body. Yes. I like to do all yes. the different things when it comes yes. to that in terms of foreplay. So if I have to give that mm -hmm. up, then of course I have to keep the kissing. Mm -hmm. But if I can, mm -hmm. if it's just like oral kissing, mm -hmm. oh, I could give that up any day. Like, well, I'll we say it's your question. <laughs> you can do it. But here's my thought. On, here's my thought. You want to hear this? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So if the kissing is that good, of which I have had, I can do my own foreplay. Mm. It, yeah. it does say, mm -hmm. it did say any mm -hmm. foreplay though. So I think mm -hmm. personal I could foreplay. Do my, right. I could do my own foreplay while I'm being kissed. Mm -hmm. And we'll still need that splash pad. <laughs> <laughs> as, long as, as long as she's hydrated, right. everybody's in trouble. Excuse me, as long as she's hydrated, <laughs> everyone's in trouble. Keep the girl well. Exactly. Yeah. With moves, right? <laughs> <laughs> Oh, Michelle, I appreciate uh -huh. you so much. Mm -hmm. Is there yeah. any any last words that you would like to share with the audience before I close this out? I mean, I could say the same last words, which is trust your instincts on a person. I don't always do it either, and it gets me in trouble every time. But you know, trusting your instincts on whether the person's good for you versus trusting the instincts of whether or not this person is safe for me are two different things. Being good for you and being safe for you are two different things. And you know, if everyone around you is telling you to run for a reason, then run. Because sometimes we just don't see what's so obvious, honestly. Mm -hmm. We're so busy looking at like the fat we got on our bodies or we think we do in the mirrors, but yet we've got a person next to us that is hurting us and we can't see that. I mean, that's how ridiculous that is. So that was just an example, but mm -hmm. you know what I mean? It's just, it, so other people would be able to see that and not us because we're not focused on that. We're focused on what we want them to be. Um, and then, you know, consent, no matter what conversations, consent, 
Oh, here's one. Conversations, consent, and condoms. <laughs> mm. <laughs> Listen, my kid throws out, you know, condoms at Planned Parenthood. They have free condoms and they have them. Um, they're, we've got all kinds. She's got a gallon size bag. There's all different colors. There's flavors, um, sizes, all that. There's female condoms that they give mm. out. Planned Parenthood is a great organization. They do exams. Look at me. I'm doing like an advertisement for them. Right. It's okay. I mean, <laughs> they do. I mean, listen, they do exams. I mean, I, I'm middle aged. They went and they did an exam for me. They send out for mammograms. They do blood work. I mean, it's a great, I had no idea. No idea. Um, they test for cancers. I mean, everything. It's not just an abortion clinic. That's not what they do. Mm-hmm. They, they do everything. So, and it's really, it's a great, clean, healthy, safe place. You have to be buzzed in there. It's very, very clean. It's unbelievable. I couldn't believe it when I went there. And um, they have everything you need. Feminine products. Sorry, guys. Feminine products. But the condoms are there. I mean, y'all can walk in and get it. I mean, they have a little brown bag and then they have boxes of condoms. So you can get as many as you want. Nobody cares. Mm -hmm. I I filled a whole bag and because she had asked me to get some that she could hand out. And I was like, party of one. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> and all these young girls are looking at me like, uh, okay, have fun. Very funny. <laughs> it was not, I, it wasn't for me. Look, I, I'm a firm believer in staying, staying with condoms regardless. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> yeah. I mean, and there's all sorts of kinds there. So, and they're free. So there's no excuses and there's Planned Parenthood everywhere. Everywhere yes. I found out. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I appreciate you so much. Thank you. <laughs> thank you. Well, to the audience, um, thank you all so much for listening to the Whole Liloquy podcast, where we step out and speak on sexuality. And just in case no one else told you this today, you are beautiful, you are worthy of happiness and joy, you are enough and then some. You may not live up to the expectations of others, but that is okay. You are only required to walk in your own shoes. May each day you live lead you towards abundance. With that said, love you all and see you next episode. Bye. Bye. Thank you for listening to the Holiloquy Podcast, where we step out and speak on sexuality. You can subscribe to the podcast through your favorite podcasting app and find us on the web at www.holiloquy.com. That's www.h-e-a-u-x-l-i-l-o-q-u-y.com. Share the podcast with your friends and join the conversation.